Good evening, everybody, um, and welcome to the launch of the Cumbria Club. My name is Andrew Armitage, and I'm delighted to be hosting and facilitating this event this evening. So this is the format for the evening, obviously a bit of introduction, which we've now had. And up next, we have a pre-recorded uh, welcome message from Lord Melvin Bragg of Wigton that was recorded last week. Uh, then Andy Beefoot, the uh, CEO of the foundation, is going to tell you a little bit about the Cumbria Club. He's also going to go into a bit of detail about uh, how COVID-19 has affected Cumbria and give you some uh, statistics and information about how the county has coped. Then we We've got our panel contributions from Andy Slattery, Assistant Chief Constable of Cumbria Police, Mary Smith of Growing Well and Paul Rowe of the Phoenix Youth Project. Finally, as I mentioned, we have some Q&A opportunities towards the end and we'll be on track to finish hopefully around about quarter past seven. Obviously, if people do have to go early, that's not a problem at all. If the conversation and the Q&A is going well and people still want to engage in that conversation, we don't have to cut off at exactly quarter past seven. We'll, uh, we'll play that by, by ear a little bit, but, uh, but we certainly don't expect to go on much longer than quarter past seven. Uh, so I will uh, move on to the introductory video from uh, Lord Melvin Bragg that was pre-recorded last week. Hello, in 1999, John Spedding of Maya House, next to Basin's White Lake, asked me to join the Cumbria Community Foundation. Mr. Spedding is a great feature of Cumbria life. His house is a testament to Cumbria culture, and of course, there's Bassenthwaite Lake, the only lake, as everybody knows, in the Lake District. But anyway, I was glad to join it. I was very glad to join it. I wondered why it hadn't happened before. It's a great idea, but like most great ideas, you realize it's obvious only when somebody else invents it. And the idea of Cumbria coming together as a community to look after itself is a tremendous idea. Because I have a feeling sometimes, and you might have that feeling too, that if we don't look after ourselves, nobody else is going to. We're at the extremity of England. We're extremely thinly, thinly populated. We don't have much political representation or crowd. We have some, but not, not a great deal. And we need to come together at this time partic particularly, when it seems to me that the local is as powerful as the national. Nationally, I think we're in very difficult, turbulent times with the country, the different countries, the big ideas, the billions pouring out here, there, and everywhere. And it's a very easy for the local to be neglected. But this is what this Community Foundation has done. They've raised since uh, 99, they've raised 45 million pounds. It's gone to 4,000 different organizations inside the county. They get two million pounds a year coming in. And the important thing is that because they know the county, they know this place, they can pinpoint it. These are places that people in London will never have heard of. Villages and towns that need to be on the map as far as they're concerned. But as far as we're concerned, as Cumbrians, they're very, very important. They help and sustain a difficult and wonderful county. And they have been extremely reliable and valuable in the corona crisis and helped enormously there. They've been extremely reliable and helpful with getting young kids who find it difficult to get any schooling at all at the moment to get schooling. They've done wonderful things. When I was a kid and went to church a lot, there was one thing that they said, God helps those who help themselves. Basically, it was get a move on. But actually, there's something in it. Those who help themselves, we can see it all over the country now. Little shops in this place, little community things in that place. People are coming out and building things together as a community. That's what's working very well. And Cumbria is doing that very well indeed. But like everything else, it needs to grow to survive. And so I'm asking you to join, to fill in a form, to join, to contribute to this, which is not only help to Cumbrians who live there, but those of us who only go there occasionally, to those of us who millions who want to come, it's in, going to be a magnificent help for the tourist industry, which is under tremendous strain at the moment. So please join, please make Cumbria <laughs> even greater. Make Cumbria great again. Well, it always has been, but never mind. Make Cumbria great. Um, I think it's very hard to uh, to follow on from such fantastic words from Lord Bragg. And I know he would very much like to have, uh, have been here this evening, but he did have a pre-existing commitment. Uh, and I do just want to warmly welcome everyone uh, today. 
Uh, it's quite unusual for us to be online. Many of us were going to meet um, together in London in April, but the coronavirus, um, as we know, has done what it's done and we've been unable to do that. And I think it's really important that we get together and launch the Cumbria Club. Um, I want to tell you about what, we, what our aspirations are for that. But before I do that, for those who don't know, just a really short summary about what the Cumbria Community Foundation is and does. So we make life-changing grants. We support community organisations and we support individuals. And as Melvin said, we reach the parts of the county that some people don't even know and many organisations that are doing incredibly valuable work. And we'll hear from Mary, we'll hear from Paul later on about the things that they do, but you can go on our website, you can see our videos and see what that means. And we're only able to do that because families, individuals, business owners, charitable trusts choose to give through the Community Foundation. And we're going to use this evening's presentation and the Community Foundation's response to the pandemic as an example of how we've moved to respond to help people in most need. But we're here every day and we've been here for over 20 years and we plan to be here much longer. So we've created the Cumbria Club. Um, like many good initiatives, uh, it's not our idea. We've seen there's a very good community foundation down in Cornwall uh, and they five years ago started doing what we're aiming to do tonight to set a snowball rolling down a hill, you might like to say, to gather people who have a love for and a connection with the county, who may not live in the county. Many people sadly have to move away for reasons of work um, and, and for other reasons. But by growing a group of people who want to support, to give through the Community Foundation, but also perhaps to bring their own ideas and energy, then we together can make a huge difference to the county. Cornwall's Cornwall Club now has 500 members. One of the things I know about people in Cumbria or people connected to Cumbria is we're competitive and we like to be good. We like to be best. If Cornwall can have 500 members, I'm sure we can, uh, we can, we can outdo that. And why should you get involved? Well, hopefully, you'll attend interesting events. We already have our next event scheduled and we've got Joe um, on the line from the Cumbria LEP and one of the key issues facing Cumbria is its economic um, rebuilding. So we plan, we haven't got the date yet, but an event in October, which we'll invite you to, to, to. And we want, when we can, to meet in person and to have other interesting speakers. We also want you to bring your ideas and thoughts about how Cumbria can be improved. We want you to be um, informed, to enjoy the opportunity to meet new people and to be part of um, a very positive new initiative. Some of you have already signed up. Some of you have committed to signing up financially and we will be sending out that information. So for those of you who wish to be part of the club, you'll get that information uh, going forward. So that's what we are and what we hope to do with the Cumbria Club, but we want it to be your club and we want you to shape it. This is just the start of something that we hope will be very exciting. So sadly, you've got a double bill of me. Um, Andrew will now, uh, we'll move into the part of the presentation which actually will describe the Community Foundation's response to the pandemic. And the first slide, that we'll move to Andrew is just looking at some headline figures. So this is actually what does Cumbria look like against the rest of England? We have a super aging population. What does that mean? We have a lot of significantly larger than average population of older people and those are people who've needed support. Our tourist industry in particular has been devastated. We've you know, tourism normally comes out of a winter, has a strong summer, and then moves into winter and moves on. Tourism is looking at three winters. And you can actually see the statistics there about numbers of cases and deaths. So the pandemic has been a significant worldwide event, but also a significant one for Cumbria. So if we can move on to the next slide, Andrew, very quickly, this describes what's happening in the charity sector. So as I said earlier, we invest in charities 
to support the most vulnerable people. But many of our charities have been unable to fundraise. Charity shops have had to be closed. Staff have had to be furloughed. Services and income has stopped. And the key statistic there is nearly 60% of the respondents had less than six months of running costs in reserves. So these vital organisations need our support. So if we move on again, Andrew, please. We're now looking at the money raised so far. So on the 17th of March, the Community Foundation created a COVID response fund knowing that those valuable organizations would need investment and we're hugely grateful to those private individuals those charitable trusts and the national emergencies trust which as some of you may have heard david uh, Beebe, our chairman mentioned earlier on i was a founding board member and i sit on the national emergencies trust it has raised 100 million pounds nationally uh, and most of that money's gone out through community foundations with a uk-wide response so if we move on again, because we've not got a huge amount of time this evening, the next slide describes that sort of slope moving from left to right is our spend over time. And this is the point at which I'd like to give a huge thanks to Kevin Walsh and our grants committee that have met literally every week. Um, a fantastic quote we had from Age UK South Lakeland was, while other funders were deciding which <coughs> font to use on their application forms, Cumbria Community Foundation had already rolled up its sleeves, raised money and got it out in communities. And that's one of our USPs. It's actually moving fast in response to need so that people can be helped as quickly as possible. So the next slide is a picture that takes us on a journey around the county and it represents the by far the most significant part of our spend we've spent over half a million pounds so far um, on food delivery and medicine delivery through a whole range of organizations so we have literally every corner of the county represented the bottom right is love barrow families an amazing charity that we've got a long-standing relationship in barrow uh, for those of you with a love of west cumbria we have rachel holiday from the time to change project we also have Age UK, and then we have bottom left Kendall, uh, volunteers delivering uh, information on how people can get support. And then the, in the middle at the bottom is a delivery van in Alston Moor. And there've been over 300 pop-up mutual aid groups supported. And without those, the most vulnerable people and elderly people in the county, but also people and families who've been living one or two paychecks away from absolute destitution, have through this emergency phase of the pandemic been able to get really valuable support, food that they wouldn't otherwise have been able to access, emotional support and much needed medicines. So moving towards the end, an ultimate slide now, is just the breadth of our grant making. I mentioned that significant investment in food and medicine delivery, but we've also supported countless organizations move to online service delivery whether that be counseling or emotional support or um you know so some of this is um drugs and alcohol counseling bereavement counseling domestic abuse and violence has been uh, no area where we haven't supported we've invested in all of our hospices providing them with additional costs around ppe so that those charities are able to respond to the pandemic so that is what we would call is the emergency phase. So the final slide is really just looking at what are the community foundations priorities going forward. Some of you are familiar with the report that we produced a few years ago, Cumbria Revealed, which set out some of the significant challenges that people in the county already face. Sadly, the pandemic has just added an extra overlay. So we set an appeal target to raise three million pounds. We've raised about 1.6, but we still urgently need to raise more money because as you can see in those headline statistics, elderly and vulnerable people will continue to need support. People living on low incomes will need food and financial, hard, uh, financial assistance. Um, but key, key things is emotional support for people. It's been devastating for many people. And one of the things that's really dear to my heart is actually supporting children and young people that's actually those who've missed valuable education 
but also those young people going out into a jobs market, into a recession, that means that they will be especially challenged in terms of finding work. So thank you again for everyone who's donated. Um, that's a bit of a whistle stop tour. Um, and I look forward to receiving your questions uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. Okay, we are going to move swiftly on to the first of our panel contributors tonight. And I'd like to introduce you to Assistant Chief Constable of Cumbria Police, Andy Slattery. Okay, thank you very much. Um, obviously, you have to be called Andrew to be, uh, to be taking part this evening. Um, I, I'm the Assistant Chief Constable uh, here in Cumbria, but I'm, I'm also Chair of the Cumbria Local Resilience Forum. Um, and the Local Resilience Forum is the, is the body that, that sits permanently in Cumbria to plan and respond to civil emergencies. Whenever an emergency happens, in this case COVID, uh, a strategic coordinating group is set up to, uh, uh, to coordinate and lead the response in the county. Uh, and, and I chair that as well. So um, we've been involved uh, since March. Um, you'll, you've seen the statistics already, over 500 people sadly uh, have lost their lives in Cumbria. Um, but when we started uh, our response to this, the expectations from the planning assumptions were that we, were, we might lose up to 6,000 people in Cumbria, and that's the scale of the challenge that we were faced with. So to start with, um, uh, the key issues for us were around hospital capacity, uh, particularly in intensive care units, and sadly in mortuary capacity. So we worked with the hospital trusts in North and South to help build that capacity into the hospitals. But when it became clear that the numbers we were expecting would have overwhelmed the hospital facilities, we also worked uh, with the local authorities to establish recovery centres right across the county in five different locations, leisure centres and schools, which were to be um, staffed by a mixture of uh, NHS staff and volunteers uh, from the Red Cross, uh, which was you know, really proud that uh, the Cumbrian community came together, the authorities came together and achieved that because might seem simple, but uh, establishing and equipping those uh, premises was really a, a big challenge. The next issue for us was uh, around the shielding category. And you, you've heard uh, from Andy there about the fantastic work that was done across the county. This is one that really uh, was a real nightmare to start with. We thought, how on earth are we going to do this? How on earth are we going to supply all these people in this county with the food and the medicine that they require? Uh, and the voluntary sector were absolutely fabulous. Uh, in their response and it actually ended up being one of the least uh, tricky issues for us to deal with and that was largely down to the, the brilliant efforts of the uh, charity sector. The next issue that we were faced with obviously was the PPE issue. There, there, are, there is insufficient PPE uh, in the country, there's insufficient uh, PPE worldwide and trying to get a supply chain to all our critical services uh, meant that we were delivering PPE just in time. We were always just on the verge of running out of PPE right across the county. Uh, and that was a 24-7 uh, operation trying to get that PPE uh, delivered to people. Sadly, the next issue that became apparent was uh, uh, care home outbreaks and, and deaths in care homes. Uh, and that's something that affected us uh, right across North Cumbria and South Cumbria. And sadly, again, over those over 500 that died, over 200 of those died. Uh, in our care homes. Um, the key thing that reduced the, the death toll uh, across the county and across the country was the imposition of the lockdown, um, which at the time, I have to say, I was greatly relieved when lockdown was brought in because we were experiencing some real problems at the start uh, with visitors coming to Cumbria. But the lockdown didn't come without its problems, um, not least the travelling to Cumbria when you couldn't come, and since then, we've been working with the National Park Authority and a wide range of uh, public and voluntary sector um, agencies to, to deal with some of the consequences of the new type of visitors that we're having coming to the Lake District. And, and you've all seen, I'm sure, the, uh, the destruction that's happened, unfortunately, across the Lake District. Where we are now is we're, we're, we're moving into a phase that the that Im immediate and acute uh, response is no longer required in the county. We now have a health protection board sitting in the county. We've got effective test, track and trace in the county. We do have two very live outbreaks currently in Carlisle and Penrith. Um, we are managing those through uh, test and trace. Um, we hope to have those under control shortly, but uh, you know, this is new territory for all of us. 
obviously the recovery coordination group is, is sitting looking at the, the, the wider long-term issues uh, for the county. So the strategic coordinating group is, if you like, taking a, a back seat uh, for now. We hope we don't need to respond again in our full uh, emergency response as we were earlier in the year, but we are there ready to respond should, be, uh, should we be required to by the Health Protection Board or indeed the recovery group. So that's a whistle stop to of uh, where, where we are. Thank you, Andy. Appreciate that. Uh, we'll move straight on to our next panel contributor tonight, who is Mary Smith uh, of Growing Well. Mary's going to share her screen, so she's got some slides and a video to share with you. So over to you, Mary. Thank you very much. Right, can everybody see? Yep, looking good. All good. So, uh, yes, thank you for listening this evening. I'm Mary and I'm the Chief Executive of Growing Well, as Andrew says. And just to give you, if you don't already know, as a background of who we are and what we do, we are a registered mental health charity based just outside Kendall at Low Sizer. Um, we are coming up for 16 years old now, and we are also an organic growing enterprise. So we are based on six acres of farmland. Uh, we are a workplace and 20% of our income is generated through the growing and selling of our organic vegetable and fruit crops. We are also an accredited training centre. So at any given time, we will have around 100 people um, coming to us from all across Cumbria and um, parts of Lancashire as well, actually, for their mental health recovery. And in order to aid that, we use a combination and always have of activity, training and support. So for the activity, uh, people that come to us have a choice of either working on the field in horticulture um, and market gardening and preparing for the sale of the vegetables or in the kitchen in cooking and generating the food for everybody on site that day and also ready meals, soups, chutneys and things for sale. And we also offer uh, other vocational training opportunities in tractor driving, for example, but also um, in horticultural qualifications and catering qualifications. And that is all beautifully wrapped up in a package of support, which is delivered by uh, professional occupational therapists. So we're very, very much activity and occupation focused. We're not a talking services, uh, talking therapies service. So just to follow on from that point, what do we do and how do we make a difference in people's lives? So there are many people in Cumbria and in fact the UK that, that cannot or, or do not get on well with uh, talking therapies. And so we use the activities that we do on site to help people find a common language and work through whatever they might be suffering from. In some cases, it might be people that have suffered acutely from a recent bereavement in the family, a divorce, a loss of a job. Um, but we are a broad church. We work with people who suffer from mental illnesses that have lasted them a lifetime. Um, and people come to us for as long as it takes to get them better because we believe that's what, um, what leads to their sustained um, better mental health. We do work quite um, aggressively on people's progression though and one of the most important um, aspects of that is people's return to work. Many of the people that come to us have this aspiration, it is their key goal when they come to us. So as well as starting with a gentle start of working back in groups with people, socialising, all of the things that have been taken away uh, by a crippling mental illness, when people start to grow in strength again, we introduce them to training opportunities, accredited training, uh, buddying systems, work experiences outside of Growing Well in partner agencies, and we do an occupational life skills training course to get people work ready. And we do this because um, it reduces people's reliance on statutory services, which as we know are overburdened. There are queues and waiting lists throughout Cumbria for mental health support and that's not going away anytime soon and by people coming to us perhaps one day a week it might be enough to keep them out of the hospital out of the emergency departments or out of the GPs. So Covid that's been interesting <laughs> and uh, since we're an activity-based 
charity um, closing the site um, rendered it very difficult really to work on work in that way. We have, however, um, kept up a remote support with more than 80 people. Uh, we work with a with a therapy tool called a recovery star, which is very vocationally based. So we've been working remotely with these 80 people that stretch from Barrow right the way up to Penrith. Um, on setting themselves goals to help them get through these days which have been quite long and difficult and often confusing. On, this, on the charity side of things we're 200 hours a week of labour down so these people that come in for their mental health recovery are also our workforce and they help us to underpin the income that we generate from selling the crops. So we're no furlough situation here <laughs> And very luckily, my staff were only happy to oblige um, for redeployment onto the field, which um, I can speak from personal experience has been a massive and steep learning curve for some of us who are not particularly horticulturists. But in order to carry on growing and to keep doing what we do best um, and continue supporting people as best we can do, we decided that we wanted to stay open. Um, so the 70 crop share bags that go out within the local community each week, packed full of uh, fresh vegetables and fruit only grown here, have still been going. Sadly though, and as Andy's touched on, fundraising has changed and all of our fundraising events for this year have now been cancelled, which has a massive impact on us to the tune of about £60,000. So moving on to the future, which has to be bright, um, on the 22nd of June, we reopened our site safely and with all social, social distancing measures in place. Um, and the 80 plus people that we've, we've been working with remotely have come back and are able to work with us across the site again, which is just fantastic. We'd seen a really steep decline in their mental health in the couple of weeks before we took that decision and almost immediately everybody stabilised again by being back. We've also reopened again to referrals and within the first week of reopening to referrals we had 35 referrals which is quite significant um, for us. Um, that's because, and I think everybody's anticipating it, there is a wave of population mental ill health um, probably on the way but it was already there. Um, we know that um, more people are struggling with their mental health than, than they ever have. So we know that the demand for our service is very high and it's going to, going to continue to rise. The fundraising landscape has changed indefinitely. We're scrabbling around a bit with that at the moment um, and we are looking to all sorts of things that we can do in next year to make up for the events that we've lost this year. Uh, but lucky for us, we were granted an emergency grant from the Cumbria Community Foundation and that was to help us to keep on growing. So we have been given some money so that we can bring in some expertise to keep us growing on the field and so that we can expand our crop chair scheme. At the moment from 70 to 100, but who knows, maybe even more, because we believe that sustainable income is going to play much bigger part in our survival and continuation in the near future. So extremely grateful for the grant. Um, as always, it's better coming from the beneficiaries. So I just wanted to now show you um, a video of one of our beneficiaries who did a bit of filming for ITV Border last week. So here is Kath. It's been horrendous. I can't cope with this lockdown. I feel some days I just can't cope with it. I was worried, just frightened about the virus, really. And that's the top and bottom of it. I was frightened because um, you don't really see anyone. So, and I've listened to too much news. We just haven't been out anywhere. So it's been quite hard, really. I've really missed it. I'm a bit worried about coming back. You know, there's two metres. I'm telling people to go away, <laughs> but um, I feel at home, they understand me. I felt very privileged that A, I could be redeployed and that I wasn't furloughed. So that for me maintained my mental health, just coming on site, growing things, being interactive, so I can fully understand it from the volunteer experience, having been there 
uh, myself. I think it's very important that the kind of the volunteers feel safe and valued coming back on site, but more importantly is that social interaction. Hopefully that's given you a bit of an insight into us and what we do and the impact of COVID on our beneficiaries and on our charity. And I want to say a huge thank you um, for the for the boost that we've been given from the Community Foundation so we can keep doing what we're doing. And just to close, I just want to make very clear that um, we are, make no mistake, go adapt and change and be flexible and keep doing that and looking at ways that we can continue to generate the income that we need to keep going. But now is not the time for us to cap or limit our service. It is absolutely vital in this area. So thanks to everybody that has contributed so far. And I'm very glad of the opportunity to be here this evening to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, great presentation and, uh, and a powerful video there as well. So we'll move straight on to Paul uh, from the Phoenix Project. And you also are going to share your screen. Yeah, hopefully people can see that one, your lords. There we go, can we see that? Yep, yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to come and speak today. I know, know a few faces here, including one of my trustees, Ivan Baldwin, who's already messaged me and said, don't mess it up. So cheers, Ivan. So um, I'm, I represent the Phoenix Youth Project. We've been around for 17 years. I've been here managing the project for 15 years. And like everybody, We've never seen anything like this ever in any of our lifetimes and certainly in our project's time. So we work with young people aged eight to 19 and um, we, run, we run three youth clubs, running 12 sessions a week um, for everything from coming and get off the streets to, to accreditations and, and a lot of inform, informal education, a lot of learning. And all of a sudden we, we sort of weren't able to do that really. Just a little thing for those who, who aren't familiar with West Cumbria and those who aren't living in Cumbria, we're, we're based we're based here on the little tip of West Cumbria and the, the, the point of where we are in, in Cleeton Moor and, our, and Frizzett and Moor Row where we work is we're a good hour away from Carlisle, about an hour and a half away from Barrow and you know we're, we're an hour away from services really, like real services and that means we're, we're really rural, you know you can't pass through, through Cleeton Moor by accident, you know it's not near the M6, it's not near anything ex sort of nationally exciting if you like. So, um, you know, we are very isolated and very remote in, our, in, in, in where we are. You know, most of Cumbria is quite idyllic and people think it's a beautiful place to live. Um, you know, you know, we, you know, for us, we're close to Wendell Lake and, and not a million miles away from Keswick. You know, that, that part of the country is lovely. Um, but, you know, where we are in West Cumbria is in the heart of the West Cumbrian deprivation. Some of our young people can go a day without a meal. Some of our young people don't leave West Cumbria. They've never been on holiday. You know, never mind going abroad, they just don't leave West Cumbria. The aspirations are immensely low. There's a, there's a, there's a whether it's perception or whether there is a real lack of opportunity, um, you know, our young people just believe um, the big nuclear plant up the road isn't for them, they're not intelligent enough, they're not scientific, so there's not a lot for them. And obviously, the COVID-19 pandemic has made all of that worse. Um, you know, you know if, if anyone's been struggling before the pandemic, they've definitely been struggling during it and they're definitely going to struggle after it. But... All that said, it's our jobs to make their lives better, to support them to achieve their best, and to try and try and turn that around, really. So it's February 2020, no social distancing. This is our AGM. This was a fantastic day, and this was celebrating our young people's achievements. And they're all the certificates that they've done in the, done throughout the year. They've done some Heart Start, they've done some Asdan work, they've done some Duke of Edinburgh work, and we have we have awards like Young Person of the Year. And it was a fantastic event. Um, that's a, the core of our Clayton Mill Youth Centre, and that's how it used to look. And it was always a great place to go, always full of young people. And um, in February, we had one session where we had 42 of our younger group, our eight, 12 year old group in one session. So it was vibrant, it was busy. It was, it was a real kind of exciting place to be. But all of a sudden we, we got locked down and we went to this, this new normal Zoom, um, which, which as we're all finding out tonight, it's not perfect, it's good, but it's not, it's not perfect. And, uh, you know, trying to get 10 young people, 12 young people all on the same screen, you know, not being able to talk over each other was difficult, but we provided a real lifeline to those young people. We've got to remember what it was like at the beginning. We weren't allowed to leave our houses, you know, we were allowed to go for an hour of exercise. Young people, teenagers especially, are the age group that spend the longest amount of time outside the household out of any other age group. Teenagers, you know, get home from school, have something to eat and go out. 
and all of a sudden they weren't allowed to do that. They couldn't see their friends. They they're kind of they they kind of linked to normality had gone. Um, you know, so they're at home. They're falling out with family members. They're falling out with younger siblings. And you know, just what we provided for them was just a light relief, really. We expanded from five days a week to seven days a week. We expanded from 12 sessions to 17 sessions. We did things like DJing, we did quizzes, we did gaming sessions, we did one-to-one drop-ins for those that were really struggling. And we tried to sort of mirror the things we do in youth club and have discussions around particular issues. So we talked about one of the first things we did was we did some information on the COVID pandemic. Another one, we had three wishes. So two weeks ago, you probably wanted a sports car, a house, and uh, to, go, to, go, to go to America on holiday. Now, young people were missing, missing the grandma, missing the friends and, and, and missing some of the simple things in life. And, we, you know, we gave young people education, but we, we had fun, basically, as you can see from that slide there. And this just shows some of the, some of the things we did down on a, on a, on a Friday night. So we had a, we, you know, we had a, we had, we had a DJ session where we, we were aiming it at some of the young people that weren't logging on to our Zoom sessions. And we were sort of thinking it was a bit too cool for them, really. So the light music, light DJing. So we, we got in there and it was a way of getting them, getting in contact and just making sure they're all right, really. Um, we, had, we had a bingo every, every, every Saturday and a pub quiz every Sunday. We did a couple of social actions as well. You know, we wanted to, you know, young people want to help people. And um, through some funding we, we already had from the foundation, we did a social action in, in, um, on VE Day in Moor Row that was still very much in the height of lockdown. The young people wanted to create a massive street party, but that was impossible. So basically what we did in a nutshell was kind of provide afternoon tea and we, and we sort of delivered that to the, to the elderly residents of the village. And, you know, that was a fantastic, fantastic that's my, my lead worker, Joanne, with, the, with, with kind of the, the pack there ready, ready to go. And in Frisenton, the young people there t- talk about uh, board games. What what they said was they were getting a bit of a drain of of, of all this technology because they were doing schoolwork online, they were doing youth club online, they were they were gaming online, they were watching TV, and they were they were sat in front of a screen twenty four seven really. So you know they said, well actually, if we can get some board games to, to families, um, they can bring them together and, and get them stop stop them arguing and get them having fun together. So we linked up with um, Frisent Community Group and with the um, food bank in Frisent, and we donated four hundred pounds worth of games. And picked by the young people, they were all games that you play with your family. So that was a that was a great success there. When we when we overnight had to suddenly go home and deliver our services online, we were doing it with with borrowed laptops from our youth centres, which were seven or eight year old. They were terrible. So we got five thousand pound quite quickly, like um, Andrew mentioned before, to purchase new laptops. We had seven staff all working in seven homes, all away from each other, and so we got just over four thousand pound to buy seven laptops, put the proper software on it, and that made an absolute. Um, you know, massive difference to what we were able to do. Not only the delivery of our session, but just planning it as well, because we could we could actually have proper things to do. And by June, we got permission from our, our local police to go out there and do detached youth work. So that was fantastic. For the first time, we weren't stuck to the screens. Um, social distancing was, was was as it is now. It was it was obviously huge, much bigger than then at the very very start, and it was tentative steps. And we just went out there and met young people because young people were already out and were already hanging around. So we needed just to just to get out there really. And we loved, we loved those first sessions. It was fantastic just to be outside talking to real people again. Um, and then by July, we were quite surprised, to be honest, but by July, we, got, we suddenly got told we could reopen um, by the government. So that was fantastic. We've, we're now in the third week of reopening. Um, I'm now sat actually in the office with Clayton Youth Club right behind me. And that's what Youth Club looks like now. We're very restricted. Um, we can only get 18 young people in one new centre, 13 in another. So it's not a lot. Um, and we have to, you know, really barrier things up. You can see the pool tables there the distance we have to put around them with a tape on the floor and things. But we're back open, our young people are back, and it's fantastic just to be just to be back open again. Um, you know, it's great. And I think we're all going to take questions at the end there. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, great, uh, great work that you're doing up there. Um, we have got a couple of questions. Um, now, I'm going to go in chronological order. There was a question early on from, uh, from Anne and Charlie. Um, uh, are there any initiatives led by the foundation or the LEP, for example, to help this year's school leavers find work? Now, that's not so much a question directed at you, and there has been some answers in the chat. Uh, so I just really wanted to draw people's attention to that. Um, but, Paul, the first question for you, really, what differences are you seeing in young people's attitudes as a result um, of the pandemic? Well, it, it, like, like, like us, like anyone, there was a real roller coaster, wasn't there, where, you know, stay at home and kind of almost fear, fear the virus. But the thing for young people is young people were told kind of, you're all right, it's, it's all the people who were at danger, danger from this pandemic. Um, but young people did the same as everyone. They went home, stayed at home and, um, and, and, did, and, you know, 
very much did what the family told them to do, really. And our contact with them was 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 online. And kind of the concerns really were stuff about future, about jobs, about education. Um, you know, they they were there, they were the, what they were really worried about. They were worried about elderly residents, about sorry, elderly members of the family. Um, but then when the government changed their mind and said, well, it's going to change their mind, but the in the lockdown and said, you can now go out with up to six people in your household, from outside your household, all of a sudden then, not just in Clayton, or everywhere, young people started going out and the, the drop-off online went off massively and we, we, we were trying to get out there and trying to deliver that such youth work because there is, there is starting, we, we think that it's going away now we're open, but there's been starting to be quite a lot of nuisance behaviour with young people because they've kind of almost been let off that leash. You know, they've been, they've been sat at home for so long and not seeing the friends, the kind of, you know, they're, they're, they're out a lot of the moment. So it's about, for us, getting them in the youth club and trying to channel that, and channel, channel that in a positive way, really. Okay, and there is one more question for you, Paul. And just because of time, I'm going to ask it directly. It's from Caroline Thompson, um, who says, it's an incredibly impressive online programme. What level of access do young people have to online services to be able to uh, participate in some of the programmes that you've been running? Well, we've, we've kind of closed it all down now because it was, it was fantastic when we had it, but, you know, meeting face-to-face is much better. You know, I likened it to, you know, if I, if I, I like bangers and mash, and if I had bangers and mash in the fridge, I'd enjoy that. But when I go out for a meal, I have steak because steak's lovely, isn't it? You know, and so this was all right when this was, this was really good at the beginning when, when we, we had, we were literally locked down, but now we can go out, now we can open our buildings. The online stuff, just, it, just for young people, it just isn't that good. You know, they can't talk, they've got to sit. You, your guy, you guys are all sitting there muted. Imagine you're 13 and you, you're bursting out and want to talk. You wouldn't stay online for two minutes just listening. So, um, you know, for us, we're, we're happy to be offline and back, back in our centres. And, and, and did you feel that there was sufficient availability of, of, of access to, to people getting online, whether it's through laptops, uh, through broadband connections, that type of thing? Not really. It's, it's hard to track it, really, because obviously we, were, we, we, could, we couldn't really go out and, and do a lot about that. So it was almost those that did, did, and those that didn't, didn't. Um, you know, but there was, this, there was definitely, there definitely is some young people that didn't access it. And there was, there was certainly barriers there um, to access. You know, we do live in very deprived um, areas, you know, so it, it definitely did have that knock on effect, definitely. All right. Thank you, Paul. That's all for now. Um, I'm going to come to you, Andy, next, if I can. And the question that was submitted before the event, how is social distancing being maintained in the county and how are communities reacting to the return of visitors to tourist areas? Yeah. Um, OK, so in terms of social distancing, um, I have to say uh, it's patchy um, uh, for lots of different reasons. The nighttime economy causes a problem because obviously when people drink, they lose their inhibitions and start uh, forgetting about social distancing. And the outbreaks in Carlisle have been partially centred around licensed premises. And most licensees have been very responsible and uh, collecting uh, the details and all the rest of it. Um, uh, but I think it's been a salutary lesson, the fact that we've had to put comms out over the last week to uh, asking people that have been to particular places to go for a test. So I think it's, that's really helping to get it into people's consciousness. In other places where it's very busy, uh, and Keswick uh, Marketplace has been uh, used as an example this week, because it is so busy, um, people aren't adhering to social distancing, and we are working together with a subgroup of local authorities to look at how we can encourage that social distancing in the busy tourist uh, hotspots. Um, in terms of uh, how are communities responding? I think uh, it sort of depends, I suppose, where you make your livelihood. Um, those involved in the tourist industry are obviously delighted that um, the visitors are back into the Lake District. Uh, but as we were talking about earlier today, we, we sort of had a period where the Lake District was very quiet. And then suddenly it's, it's become rather busy. We've got a problems around antisocial behaviour, whether it's uh, camping, littering, fires, bonfires, off-road driving, various other things that are causing angst in local communities. And we're really keen that we deal with that robustly so that the visitors who come, and they're very welcome to come, uh, respect the local landscape, respect the local communities, uh, and, and we get back to a harmonious relationship. So that's something that we are working hard on as a group of uh, agencies. Um. Next question comes uh, to Mary, and the question was, how will Growing Well react to the increase in demand for emotional and therapeutic support? 
Uh, well, lucky for us, we were already anticipating that before the pandemic, so we had already done some planning around that. Um, I don't know how what the impact's going to be now after the pandemic, but we certainly need to keep going, uh, thinking about and working on the plans that we had. Uh, practically, in the short term, um, for coming out of lockdown and getting getting back to the site, we're obviously a farm, we're on six acres and there's a lot of social distancing that can happen, but the inside spaces, I think it's only fair that we let people sit down or go to the toilet if we're going to ask them to work on the field all day, they are limited. So in the short term, some shelter for people, which at the moment is looking like we might have to clear out one of the polytunnels instead of growing in there and put some seating in there for people. Um, we are only open to our core beneficiaries at the moment on a Monday to Thursday. So we have Friday, Saturday and Sunday to play with. And that's one of the next ideas, generating as much sustainable income as we possibly can, which is why we've kept on growing is obviously really, really important. And I suppose the biggie is that we know that one day this site will hit capacity and we do think we have a model for something that works and we constantly question why it's fair that people have to travel an hour from Barrow to access our service or an hour from Eden and perhaps we really need to start putting the wheels in motion for, a, you know, for another or other sites. OK, well, uh, we wish you the very best of luck as uh, as you no doubt see that demand uh, for support increase. Now, I'm going to um, hand back to Andy um, because I need to ask you, Andy, how do people get involved with the Cumbria Club? Um, it's uh, 20 past seven, so we've overrun slightly. But Andy, if you can tell us a little bit more about how people can get involved and, uh, and then obviously you can lead on just to uh, summarise and close the session for us. Thank you very much. So... I think, as I said at the beginning, this is the start of something. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. You can easily get involved by um, joining and making a financial commitment. And to uh, remind people, all donations in this year will go to our COVID-19 response fund. But I think what I'd, although money's absolutely vital to what we do, I think I'd like your ideas. I'd like your feedback as to whether this event has worked well for you, what else you might like to know, what else you would like to do, um, you know, what skills you've got, what interests you've got. And I'm very happy for people to email me, uh, to pick up the phone and Susan will send out, uh, our development assistant will send out an email uh, tomorrow giving people the opportunities. But I also like people, if they've found this useful, if they found it interesting, uh, if we're going to, um, uh, Vi with Cornwall, uh, I'd like you to think, do you know people who might be interested in getting engaged in this? Uh, are there people who would like to know more about what's happening in the county? And are there people with ideas that can really help us uh, come out of this, uh, this pandemic? So, you know, time has run on. I hope you've enjoyed it. Hugely appreciative for everyone for their contributions as speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew, for uh, running all of the technology and for the Community Foundation team for making it possible. But most of all, for those of you who've joined us as guests, for those of you who've already signed up, for those of you who've given uh, in time uh, and in finances to any of the Foundation's work, thank you. And just uh, hope that I'll see you again, um, preferably face to face. Um, but if not, we will, as I said before, have other online events and just thank you very much indeed. If you've got any other follow up questions, like I say, please email them over and thanks again. Thanks, Andy. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. That uh, concludes tonight's session. Uh, very appreciate your time that you've taken to be with us this evening. Uh, take care, stay safe, look after yourselves and uh, hopefully we will see you at a future event. <laughs>